Well, um, it's not just me, it is the whole uh, ecological movement, especially the movement of deep ecology, which comes out of American Buddhism, that sees the uh, devastation which we are creating as human beings, as some scientists would say in this Anthropocene, that is uh, the culture and the earth totally determined by human beings and by the interests of human beings, that we uh, create this because we are well, estranged from our environment. We are not anymore, we don't see ourselves anymore as parts of nature, as part of evolution, but as the masters of nature and exploit everything according to our own interests. And exploitation always means, you know, greediness, which again doesn't have limits. You see, we are not greedy because we're hungry, that's different. Uh, when we are hungry, our body tells us you have to satisfy your hunger. But greed is getting more and more, even if I don't consume it, I need it just for an aggravation or an ex-aggravation of my ego identity. And this is exactly the analysis which uh, we have in Buddhism. Of course, as you know, many religions uh, would diagnose the problem of uh, humankind and the problem of uh, human beings, which has always been there, it's not new, but due to technological means which we have today, it is so aggravated. So many religions would uh, identify greed and egocentrisness, and in Christian parlance would be, you see, the, the estrangement from God as the root of uh, the sin or the, the sinful behavior as a uh, monotheistic traditions would call it, and as the uh, cause for suffering, as Buddhists would call it. But the difference is that Buddhists would not say this is the human nature. They would argue this is the ignorance of human beings about human nature. And ignorance is something which can be overcome. So the Buddha doesn't give only the analysis of the problem, and this would be exactly the greed and egocentricness, the, the misconception about the status of the human being in the world, but he also shows how it can be overcome. So it's not the nature and human beings are bad, they behave badly because they have a different, or they have an have a inadequate uh, cognition. And to change this is the whole Buddhist path. So we can do something about it. And this is, I think, why so many people today, even without you know, trying to become Buddhists in a cultural or religious sense, are fascinated by this Buddhist analysis and by the Buddhist practice to overcome these, as is usually translated, the defilements, the klesha of egocentricness and, and of uh, hatred and of uh, greediness. And I think this is the basic attraction Buddhism has. And it needs to be applied, of course, uh, in all fields of life. It needs to be applied in, in the educational system, it needs to be applied in the, the way families are run, in the way societies are organized, economies are uh, organized, and so on. So it is not a teaching or, or a method or a path which is... Uh, uh, different from everyday life and uh, something you do in the meditation center or on Sundays or in your leisure time in order to attain nirvana, maybe part of it, but it's essentially a method or a way to improve and per perhaps even radically change the human relationship towards himself, herself and all the other sentient beings. Uh, you see, um, now first of all, uh, Buddhism, like any other religion uh, we have today too, is a historical development. It has come in time, not so long ago, just two and a half thousand years in the history of humankind, that is a very short uh, period. And uh, during this time it has changed, it has changed dramatically. So from its Indian roots, the first dramatic change was when Buddhism came to East Asia, to China, in the second first maybe, uh, at least second century AD, uh, there it adapted to the Chinese culture. And the Chinese culture is uh, defined on, or runs on very, very different uh, principles than the Indian.
culture. There are many reasons for this, it's not our issue now. But here, a tremendous change. Buddhism really underwent, as we today say, a paradigm shift. And then later, when it came to other uh, regions of the world too, and especially now, of course, since the 18th or 19th century, Buddhism has come, as we say, to the West, whatever this is, uh, to America and Europe. And here, of course, we have again a totally different culture, lang different languages, different patterns of thinking, of uh, making relationships among human beings and so on. So Buddhism undergoes a tremendous change again. And here, of course, we have, again, similar to what we have uh, in the history of other religions too, the question, what is essentially Buddhism? What is essential, what we cannot give up? And what is the periphery? What is uh, religious observances or, uh, as the Buddhists themselves call it, upaya, that means uh, skillful means to achieve the goal, but you can have other means as well. So, and of course, this is disputed and this is debated. And our conference here is, uh, like many other conferences and like many other uh, attempts and uh, books and so uh, by Buddhists, trying to find what is essential for uh, the practice of human beings today in our societies. And this is certainly, I would think, and this is, uh, has come out in our conference, uh, training of the mind, uh, training of the mental states, and especially the, to find the balance between cognition and emotion, and the way we can uh, influence uh, these, how we can uh, deal with our aggressive emotions, for instance, in order to find uh, peacefulness of the mind, one-pointedness, shamatha in the, uh, the tradition. But then on this basis, this is not just enough. Buddhism is not just uh, becoming calm and so, then you can do many other practices. It is to apply this state of the mind, this composed or concentrated state of the mind to your understanding, to your self-cultivation. And this is usually called vipassana, the direct and proper seeing into the world. And Buddhism, from the very beginning, has as this principle of how the world is composed and how we are in the world and how our thinking and emotions, everything is related to it, calls it pratitya samutpada. That means everything happens in co-dependent origination, or in simpler words, one phenomenon arises because of another one, and this again influences the other one and its own. So everything is a network of mutual relationships, or maybe even more um, pointed, Things are not what they are, and then go into relationships, as it were, which can be this way or that way. But things are what they are because of their interdependency in relationships. And Vipassana, or the, the, the proper seeing in Buddhism, is a pro proper way of perceiving reality and then thinking about it and relating to it cogn in cognition and emotion. The proper way is based on this principle. But not just as a mental principle I think about, but as something which I, in experience, changes myself. And I think this is essential to Buddhism. And then everything will happen. You see the Buddha himself and the scriptures, it's, uh, uh, the tradition says, all these metaphysical questions, whether time has a beginning or time has an end, whether the Buddha and Nirvana are still existing or not existing, or likely these things uh, are metaphysical questions. You have good reason for one answer, you have good reasons for another answer. This cannot be decided, and it's irrelevant. Do your practice, the practice as we just described it, do it in the way, I would add, your culture allows you to do it, in the categories and maybe also in relation to the aesthetic, artistic and so on experiences you have. But the practice we were talking about, this is essential. And it can be expressed in different ways. And if, for instance, this was disputed here in our conference, the idea of reincarnation. If this is not necessary to you and to your practice, leave it. 
But if it's necessary for your practice, and I would argue some idea, maybe not, the, there are many ways of reincarnation because Buddhism itself is not one unity, but many, many different theories about it. But something that you have the confidence that what you cannot achieve in this life, and obviously most of us, maybe 99%, I don't know, will not reach Buddhahood in this life. So, but this is, this is the goal we are all striving for. There must be a way or must be some space or must be some possibility to attain it. So the classical way talking about it is reincarnation. So if you have another way talking about it, it's fine. Uh, so reincarnation as, as the idea as such, or, or the imaging we, we do with it, is not essential. Essential is the confidence, the expectation, the hope, that um, in the end, even if we cannot achieve it during these 60, 70 years or so, there is a possibility to achieve the goal, to, to attain nirvana. Now, for instance, uh, when Buddhism came to China, you see, China didn't have an idea of reincarnation. They uh, have totally different uh, ideas on ancestors, ancestor worship and all that. So the idea of reincarnation, of course, was part of the Buddhist heritage. It, it was there and formally uh, Chinese Buddhists would acknowledge ah, there's something like reincarnation. But this was not important. They didn't talk much about it, especially in Zen Buddhism. Your practice is here and now. Dalai Lama sometimes says, ah, oh, don't talk so much about nirvana, nirvana is later. Now do your practice. And I think this is a very uh, solid Buddhist principle. Uh, don't look into uh, metaphysical things and this and that, but do your practice right now, then you will prepare your mind uh, to experience things Buddhists talk about. And not only you experience, but you will prepare yourself for a behavior toward other sentient beings in such a way that all of them can live in a mutual relationship and not in this exploitative pattern which we have today in our exploitation of the, of the resources. <laughs>